So I'm going to start call the meeting to order at 735. Um, we have, uh, I believe, a quorum present. Mike Wheeler, Mike Casolo, Scott, myself, Amy Chickles, Carolyn Bain, Liz Bacon, Marcy Minnick, uh, Caroline Luz, uh, Reed Bartold, and uh, a guest speaker, uh, Steve Alvani. Um, we're going to bear with Mike as he does a call in and he'll be able to, he, can, he, he can't hear any of us, but we can all, can everybody put a thumbs up and say, can you hear me? Everybody's good? Okay. All right. Terrific. Um, all right. First order of business will be to approve the minutes from um, the last meeting, which was March 4th. Uh, just as a reminder, Scott and um, Jen were not in attendance. Um, right. Can I have a motion to approve the minutes? So I'll, I'll move, make the motion, Amy. Okay. All right. Any a second? All right. All right. Mike and Marcy. And then all those in favor? Say aye. 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 Any any opposed? Okay. All right. All right. So with that, those minutes are approved. Um, all right. Uh, we have no resolutions uh, for a group for us to deliberate and report on to the broader RTM. Next, uh, on Monday, the only resolution I believe is going to be the pickleball courts. Uh, everybody should have gotten that warning today. Of us being together and having Steve Olvang give us a quick update on the, you know, fastly moving. Um, pending legislations that are happening at Hartford uh, and have him give an update as to what the Planning and Zoning Commission has done with regards to testimony on behalf of Darian and what they've done uh, with regards to opening up testimony to our town to have an opportunity to uh, weigh in on, on what people believe and feel about the pending legislations. And then also just a little forward looking what we see on the horizon and then open it up to any questions uh, that anybody might have regarding anything P and Z, um, projects, school, uh, legislation, anything like that. Okay, um, with that, Steve, thank you again for taking the time to be with our group. We really, we, there's, a, there's a lot going on and we, you know, I think it's important for us to just keep abreast of it. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Amy. Appreciate that. You're welcome. I um, I mean, I said it a bunch of times. I was on this committee once before. I think it was with Carolyn B at the time, and I love going back to it. You know, it's, it's where it all started, I guess. Um, before we get into the um, into the um, state stuff, the bills that we we're going to talk about, there's a couple of two good things I want to really um, emphasize, and everything's pretty much good. Uh, last night we approve the um, latest um, certificate of occupancy and, and temporary certificate of occupancy for the federal project, which oh, is actually, okay. um, Walgreens can probably be open, you know, within a month. The, the way that that um, the way that resolution was written is the whole shoot and match had to have a certificate of occupancy at one time for anything to open. Um, but Walgreens is ready. If you drive by there, the lights are on. Um, I bet you there's a bottle of aspirin already inside there that you can buy if you get a headache. Uh, but that's going to open. They're going to be able to get a TCMO, which usually lasts 90 days, and then it can roll into a CMO. As soon as they get a TCMO, the store is going to flip open. It helps them open up by at least two weeks earlier. Um, supposedly, Walgreens only opens up one day a week. Um, across the country. That's similar to a lot of other towns. Target only does it like three times a year. Um, so you're going to see Walgreens open up. The one thing that's really, really important is that all this gets approved by the fire marshal um, because like there's got to be a fire hydrant that's open. And so all that stuff's in conjunction with them, but we have to weigh in. Um, as soon as Walgreens gets open, the old Walgreens will knock down and then they're quote unquote off to the races. Um, okay. And stuff so that's really cool the other thing that um is really important to me this whole um pandemic and this virtual meeting stuff um has waken up a lot of people and it's actually really kind of cool 
because there is a lot more participation people can come in it makes it easier what, what i'm trying to figure out is if on a going forward basis if we can make this um keep going in in my line in my world i'm calling it a hybrid model where some people can come but can be in the room i mean i personally like being in the room but other people can be on the hybrid model that's got to do with two things one is um hardware and software and the other is um, legislative approval the hardware part is what and i think i spoke to amy about this um before the jeremy came to us last time before jeremy came to you guys last time with the budget and it's really not his money or it's not, it shouldn't be in his budget we have to get the um i call it the first selection room wired um we, 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 steve we, we are, are there's a, there's yeah, a plan that's been approved, approved and it'll, it'll be done, done in the next, next month. month yeah that's the good news I, jim cameron did it and it's they summoned either donated or gave something like three and a half grand so we got, we got the, the uh, uh, Darian Cable, Cable, the, uh, uh area, area nine, nine. We took, we took our, our grant, grant and applied it to that amount. amount. Yeah, so we're we'll going to have, instead of having, um, you know, things on easels and boards on easels, um, you're going to see, you know, plans go up on a flat screen. And I think there's going to be two in the room. Um, just one just against, against the back, back wall, wall and one uh, behind, behind the speaker's, speaker's platform. platform. And you'll and be you'll able to bring people from Zoom or a go to meeting. meeting. That's cool. Jim, Jim, there's a substantial echo on your line. I'm not sure if there's any way you can adjust something. He's going that, to that's, that's just me when I that's just me when I talk. So okay, I won't talk, talk anymore. anymore. Um, so those are the two fun good things. I'm kind of psyched about that. Um, with regards to the um, legislative front, um, my my goal is to to make sure everybody has a voice, um, and we're all kind of on. You don't have to be on the same page. I take that back. Everyone has a voice and, and submits what they want to submit. What I would like to do is have everybody, whether on one side of the issue or on the other side of the issue, you know, in a bipartisan way, non-bipartisan way, because even in the town of Darien, there's 36% unaffiliated. So that's the biggest political party in town um, that everybody talks. Um, but what what we did is... Um, you know, it's a kind of a problem. Ball. This process started for us nine months ago, and I call it an upside down um, process where it started with me and Jeremy, then it went to a subcommittee, then it went to a commission. So it's a multi step process of what we're working on, um, trying to get as many voices as possible. Because um, to me, zoning is a local issue. Um, if you did go to the public. <laughs> If you did go to the public hearing, you saw some of the public hearing, some people testified that, you know, they're two blocks away from a main drag and a house next door to them could be on the market for sale and that house can get sold. And if it's, you know, if something happens, you could build, you know, an eight unit apartment building next door to somebody. That's why it's local. Lights at the high school are local. Fields at the high school are local. Oxridge is local. It's got nothing to do with, you know, political parties. So. What what we did, and, and I know you guys saw it, and, and you can always please cut me off because I don't want to repeat myself. Um, you know, it, we studied the bills since, you know, since it started in July. It got more, um, it got more active in September. The subcommittee got set in September. The bills changed in October. Um, you know, we went over it in November. Staff has been looking at it since the very very beginning um most of town hall staff and professionals have chimed in on it um it went to the full commission you know after the subcommittee looked at it somewhere in you know january february um the first letter that was written by me um or the first hearing was in late february um my first draft of the letter was dated march 2nd it was blessed by open commission. So it went from one to three to six. And then the next process was going to the public hearing. Um, and the reason why I personally really wanted a public hearing is because I wanted to see if if the town's people thought we were on the right track. You know, if we're not on the right track, I want someone to tell me we're not on the right track. And if there's another side of the argument, you know, let's hear it. Some of the proposals. You know, my position has changed 
over the nine month period, um, I was adamantly against um, accessory dwelling units. Um, I've changed my position on that. Um, you know, I think we can do something relative to affordable housing percentages. Um, I think we can we can increase that from from our 12% now to a number. Or actually, we're, we're we're a little bit of a sliding scale. It's not to 20, and it goes down to 12. Um, but we can change we can change that and make it higher. And I think that's going to be in the docket. Um, and then you guys, you know, it's it's the next piece of the puzzle. My other two pieces of this are really I would love to see go to the RTM and go to the floor of the RTM and see what the RTM has to say about it and debate it, but I know it's got a resolution. I do have a phone call back and forth relative to um, to Seth, and what he said to me is that, you know, you have to have a resolution to hit the floor. So I can't do resolutions, the first selectman can, um, but that's another piece of process. Relative to the, the public hearing, I think there's an article on the front page of the paper today, or in the paper today. I saw it on, on the E News yesterday in the Darien Times, um, talking about it and what people said and where it came down to. Um, the testimony submission time is still open for another week. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody wants to put in some testimony, um, you know, we're more than welcome to take it. The idea behind that is it's really it's 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 out of all of our hands right now. We can't do anything. The only thing you can do is write your senator, write your representative, and and tell them what your view is. So some of the letters that came into town hall, the the idea now is for us to assemble them and send them to our delegation, to the four people that that represent Darien. Um, I also want to send them the the snippet of the meeting. It's only it's only a 90 minute meeting. Um, I was all jazzed up that that Matt Blumenthal was there and Terry Wood was there. Um, I think um, Patricia Bailey Miller um, really tried to log on. Um, I didn't hear back from Bob Duff, but um, you know he already sent one email, responded a while ago that he got a letter that um, that Fred sent to him. But you know we can send them Jim Cameron's video. We can send them our letters. Um, people can send them direct. They all said send me your email. So. We've kind of done everything we could do. What I thought that that we were going to be able to do was, um, after our public hearing, I thought that there was going to be testimony when it hits the floor um, for additional time for us to put there. I was wrong. You know, we're not. So, there's the, the once it comes out of committee or any of these bills come out of committee, um, there's there's no more time for public testimony in an open setting. You can send letters in. Um, and that's, you know, I encourage that, but I thought that I could say, hey, you know, we had a public hearing, you know, this is what came out of the public hearing, blah, 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 but, you know, we can still write another letter, but there's no more public testimony in that, in that sense or form. Um, Steve, do you know if it's still any, because this, this legislation has been split across so many different bills, have they all gotten out of committee or died in committee, one or the other? Is there any still left to be heard? In, Subcommittee. That I asked that question of um, Terry Wood and Matt Blumenthal the other night. It's it's really a follow the bouncing ball. Um, I think Mike said it at the beginning that you know I didn't know that this was a full time job being on the Planning Zoning Commission. Um, so I don't know the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. We you got to remember the 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 resolutions that or the proposals that I wrote letters on is only contained to four. The second letter was 1024, which was in the Planning and Development Subcommittee. The other ones were 804, and I forget the other two that were on there. That was to a different committee. So there are multiple and multiple and multiple bills. If you look at the warning of the agenda from the last meeting, um, Jeremy and Fred had all of the bills on it that are relative to real estate, um, but I only commented on, on three of them. Uh, we did try to, we did have a quote unquote debate two meetings ago relative to the one that is, um, that's got to do with um, education for for just for, I mean, you guys may know some of this, you guys may not. There's a bill called 1024. It's all encompassing. It's got like 10 points in it. 
each one of those points in that bill is in another bill. So if the 1024 quote unquote died, some of the concepts inside those other bills are still alive someplace else. What, what I'm alluding to is inside one of the bills, there's this education component. You know, everybody thinks education is a great idea. I think it's a great idea. I've got a broker's license, I've got an appraiser's license in two states. You know, lawyers have to do continuing education. I think it's a great idea. Amy Barsanti, you have, you're a realtor. What's it, 22 hours or something like that? I think it's a great idea. So I wrote a letter that said, we think Bill 602 is a great idea. But I didn't read all of 602. In concept, I think it's a good idea. Inside that bill, it said that you have to, before you can sit on an application, you have to have your continuing education done. So for argument's sake, say Amy Barr Center, Candler Bain or Scott Zerman gets elected to the commission on November 2nd, okay? You're not allowed to sit on an application according to the bill that's drafted until you do your education. Mm -hmm. So let's say 7-Eleven application comes in on November 6th and the class, the first class that's available for six hours is not available until January. You can't sit on an application, you know? And it's, I, I didn't know that, you know, but these things change. So I could, I wrote a letter that said, we support this bill. Larry Warble read it backwards and forwards, told me what happened. And he goes, we can't support that. You know, and I was like, you know, you're right. Sorry, I missed it. You know, that's the kind of stuff that happens. But I asked Matt and Terry that question of what's alive, what's dead. I don't know. I was told that of 1024, which is quote unquote, the big one, pieces came out of committee and other pieces of it did not. And the way it was written, it has sections. There's a thing called section five and a thing called section six. Um, one of the one of the um, paying zoning commissioners, the woman from Westport, she rewrote section five and section six and submitted it to the committee. And some people liked it, some people did it. So maybe they wholesale took what she wrote and not, she's a trained lawyer. I think she went to Georgetown. Um, her name is Daniel Dobin, really smart lady. I've been on multiple, multiple calls with her. Um, you know, and, and I don't know what happened with that. So to answer your question, I don't know. I, I, you know it's hard to follow the bouncing ball. Um, but, you know, we can go through some of the specifics, but what I just want to focus on is, is it's, it's, it's a local, to me, it's a local thing, you know, and one of the, one of the drafting is, is it is, um, and the thing that things do change, you're allowed to pick a train station in your town and you can put multifamily housing near your train station. For argument's sake, say New Canaan picks um, the Talbot Chill train station. That's across your Talbot Chill train station is a piece of land that the developer called me and asked me a while ago that's in the tenant area, can we build multifamily housing there? I'm um, say, you know, you think that Darien's gonna approve something from New Canaan because it's across the street, because I think it straddles the line. I said, you know, I don't think that's gonna happen. But if the code goes in, that changes. My house is within a quarter mile of the Springdale train station. You know, if you ask crow flies, the Middlesex Club is at the end of my block. It's 10 acres. It's 15 units per dwelling. They could build, if it came through and, and Stanford picked that train station, that means 150 apartments can go at the end of my street. So that's the way I look at certain things, but it's, it's a big picture and some people may like the idea and they kind of, I think assessor dwelling units are a great idea. Um, like J Jamie Stevens on St. Nichols, half of her street is, is I think one acre and the other half I think is two acres. It switches them over a block. If she wants to put an accessory dwelling unit in her backyard in a garage and it sits on two acres, that's fine. You know, my father-in-law is in a one fifth acre zone. You know, he can't fit it in his house. But if he's got a garage and wants to do it, you can. Liz Geiger's house, right now she has a house that's got a three-car garage. So she's in a one-fifth acre zone. She could do it in a heartbeat. But you don't know that until you look at the individual house. Yeah. That's why it's local. That's why you have the review process. You know, all that stuff would go away. Okay. Are are anybody are people on the committee getting questions from from residents? Yeah. 
Mm. It happens all the time. It uh, happens all the time. Yeah. You're allowed to. This is not, it's not a public hearing. It's it's a public hearing. It's not an application. Yeah. Anybody can ask anybody any questions at any time. What are what are people hearing? I'm getting questions about a local uh, dairy and development that I just heard about this week, a proposed development to uh, turn the three parklands drive into apartments. What do you know yeah. about that? There was a there was a pre-application meeting. Um, I'm going to say it was last year. Um, that is a concept that's happened all over um, all over the tri-state region. And it's happened in Darien before. If you know the building that's that's affectionately called Garden Homes, that building was an office building that was converted to apartments. It has uh, how many apartments are in there? It has 35 apartments on it. It sits on one acres one acre of land. I forget how big it is, but most of them are um, studios, and that's an E30G application. So the concept is is you can do some kind of overlay district possibly um and convert that building from an office building which is i think it's about 50 percent vacant um with two tenants left in it um and make it into an apartment building um that's happening all over fairford county it's happening all over westchester county um and it's that thing sits in wood the zone right now the building next to it which is one parklands is a residential building now that's where there's 101 residential apartments here um that's where it go, that's that's the that's the concept and yes they did come to p and z already and had a pre-application hearing and we said keep going they could do that as an 830g application tomorrow if they wanted to it would be 30 percent um affordable housing um which is a great thing um and we really couldn't do anything about it but um, Garden Homes was an 830G application and it was supported. Um, and I think it actually was Fred Conzi's idea um, way back when, but the answer to your question is yes. So yeah, we kind there of is no two there's, 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 there's no application, you know, to, to do any zoning changes at, at, as of this point right now, and there is no op site plan application to change anything. Okay. Um, so just to clarify two things. So what what they're talking about is all affordable units in that building or 30%? No, I think it's right now that our, our Darien zoning code is if um, is 12%. 12%. So, so if, not they it, if they made it 830G and, and circumvented P and Z, it would have to be 30%. If they come to P and Z and ask for permission and it's granted, um, it would be a minimum, minimum, minimum of um, 12%. But if you remember my comments at the beginning, we may raise the bar to a different number. Okay. State then, board 10%, we're higher, we're higher. Secondly, can I just clarify that the, the person who said this to me, that um, what's, what's being considered in Hartford would encourage development within half a mile of the train station or something like that, or a half a mile of uh, public transportation. But it, it doesn't preclude putting a, a building that contains affordable housing farther away, does it? Mm, well, the zoning, it, the, what, what, it, what it says is that the zoning a half a mile from a train station and a quarter mile from a main drag would allow a would allow multifamily housing as of right. There is no affordable component in any of this stuff. There's not there doesn't have to be any affordable. Okay. All market rate. Okay. Right. I thought, I, mean, I thought at the present time that was out of 1024, but lingered. What I thought I understood Terry to say was it could linger in another bill and sneak back in. In, in another bill so that it was out of 1024 but it wasn't but it could come back from the dead correct like the educational piece that we spoke about is within 10 it's within 10 to 20, 1024 but also has its own standalone bill so if you took 1024 you could pull out the education piece but it's still alive over here it's then there's a 15 acre you know um there's a there's a 
um, 15 dwelling units per acre rule inside 1024, it also could be someplace else. But I didn't, I mean, there's there's hundreds of, there's, I don't know if there's hundreds, but there's there's multiple, multiple bills. I personally did not read all of them. I mean, there's too many of them. I focused on the, the ones that are big. I tried to find the new 1024 bill today, but I couldn't find it. I could only find the original one. So I couldn't find what the revised one was. The, the, the person that is really the nicest about all this stuff, if you read any of the Darien Time stuff online, Susan Schultz puts hot links to all the bills. But they, they institute a paywall, I think, last Friday. So if you don't have it, if you don't, if you get it to your house, you have to get your account number. I have not the fact to see what my account number is. I emailed Susan Schultz. I said, what's my account number? I put oh. it in and I'll pass the paywall. If you yeah. want to for the paywall i think it's like you know a dollar fifty for like a year subscription or something like that you know god god i'll go and look that way i didn't look at the e-edition i'll go in and look at this way yeah it is i can it's it's there's she sent me the e-edition through twitter on wednesday after she wrote the article and she said oh it's paywall locked and i'm like i got an account and it <laughs> five emails to get past it but i got past it Okay. Um, any other questions regarding the legislation before we move on to different topics? If, if you heard anything about for ADUs that they would put a mandatory pricing for 10 years that had that couldn't exceed 30% of the occupant's salary if they were 80% um, equal to or less than the median income that the the yeah. price that the rent had to be fixed for a 10-year period on on an adu that's 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 called a deed restriction mm -hmm. to be able to to be able to count towards the state mandated 10 percent, you have to deed restrict those units for a period of time for, you can put an ADU at your house right now. If you live on, you know, Delafield Island or or Toking Island or, or whatever it is, you can put an ADU in there now. And it could be a kitchen that's inside your pool house, right? As soon as the kitchen comes in, it's an ADU. If you want to rent it out and and be, um, is it altruistic or be be want to rent it out to somebody that that is that can only pay a thousand bucks a month in rent? you have to deed restrict it if you want to keep it like that for the rest of its life okay then it goes into the darian's um affordable housing fund and you're correct the math is it's going to be 60 percent of smi with state medium income and that number lands up being um, about 30 percent of your income it's a sliding scale on what the rent can be because there's difference between one bedroom and two bedrooms and three kids and four kids so it's a really complicated formula. I mean, I've got a copy of it. It's really hard to figure out, but effectively it's 30% of your income. Um, but the only way it, it, it counts towards Darian's quote unquote moratorium points is if you deed restrict it. The, the issue with, with ADUs is for argument's sake, say everyone, and we've turned them down. Right, like there's a bunch of guys that came in and said, "I'm building a pool house. I want to put a kitchen in there and a bedroom for my, you know, college kid that comes back." They got turned down. Right now, we would approve that, but what happens is it's it's a separate unit on a house. So instead of Darian having nine percent affordable, the denominator the denominator is getting bigger. Okay, what the concept is now is to have ADUs exempt from the unit count that's the denominator so it doesn't it doesn't move the it doesn't move the goalposts further away yeah yeah right. like like um palmer's that's and that's federal that's and corbin you know those are all 12 percent affordable the goalpost is 10. if you build you know and when someone knocks down a house and builds a house mm -hmm. one for one that's a wash right but if you put if if dave campbell converts his garage apartment or his garage space to an apartment that means he's got two kitchens on his house that means there's another housing unit you know i mean i told the story before i lived in 56a when i came back from college at my parents house i mean i didn't have a kitchen but i had my own bathroom my own back door 
and I could sneak in and out whenever I wanted to. <laughs> and Rachel was the wiser. And my father and mother loved it. Terry said something the other night about houses that they thought that there might be something in somewhere about houses built before 1990 would be exempt, which would change the denominator. Yeah, that's that's Greenwich's problem. Greenwich has got all kinds of um, affordable housing units that were built in the 80s um, that do not they do not count in their affordable housing stock because mm -hmm. they're after 1990. Darien had that problem, but we rebuilt Alan O'Neill and Old Town Hall Homes. So they were not included. Now they are included. So we don't have any more stuff that we can rebuild. Greenwich has got, you know, hundreds of units that are not included in their, they're called Hue Points. We call them moratorium points because they're in 1990. New York City had the same exact thing. When I was in the city, it's an 80 20 rule in Manhattan, 80% to rate 20% affordable. To be able to count, you have to renovate the unit in some ungodly amount of money to be able to make it affordable and get it back in there. Greenwich has got the same problem. They don't have the money to renovate their apartments that are older than 1990, because that's 30 years ago now, right? That's old. It's, it's an old unit because most of those programs are 30 years. Um, so they're off. All, they're all offline. Like Avalon's gonna fall offline in a few years. Um, my office here, we just sold um, Avalon Wilton. Avalon, Avalon Darien, Avalon Keenan. We're working on Avalon Norwalk now. Um, Avalon Wilton is, a, is an 830G project. Um, it's 100 units. Those units fall offline um, in seven years. So if you finance it, and the reason it matters to me, when you finance it, the rents in place today are 70% market, 30% affordable. Usually you get a 10-year loan. In year seven, your NOI is going to pop because mm -hmm. all the guys went off. So the things were a ton of money. So we had to go through all kinds of machinations. How the state's going to handle it? I mean, you can't take away a moratorium. I mean, I don't know how that works. But we don't have one anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Okay. Um all right, moving along. Any other topics that the committee would like to hear about? An update, 7-Eleven application, Oxford School. Um, Steve, you wanna just give us a snippet on the application for 7-Eleven, that hearing has been closed. 7-Eleven's we'll been, been closed and, and um, BMW have been closed. Those are our two biggest ones. Um, we had our first night of deliberations on 7-Eleven. Um, that was another nine month application process. Um, the way we typically do this is we'll break the application up into pieces. Um, so the first night that we delivered on was the text, um, the text change, which is kind of sort of what Martha was asking earlier. Um, so we debated that then the next night we're going to debate the site plan and the parking. Another night we're going to de debate traffic and, and something else. And one night maybe you debate, you know, the building style. Um, so we opened up, we did the debate on that. We didn't really come to any conclusions on that, but for a text change that you're supposed to have already thought about that prior to do the town plan and conservation of development. And the example that I give is if you read the 2016 town plan, it basically says you should light your fields for sports fields in your schools. So when we did the lights at the high school, it was in the town plan. And so you say, okay, you can do it. Also, um, if you know, I, it's set the settlers trail, um, the settlers trail housing project that um, Mrs. Glassmeyer did a few years ago. It talks about due diversity of housing for, you know, active elderly people or something like that. And, and disabled people that was in the town plan. So it's something we, we did for. There's nothing in our town plan that says bring gas stations up to you know the 20th century. You know, there's something in the town plan which I think is hilarious. There's something in the town plan that says if you ever want to connect Old Kings Highway and North and South together, you have to put a tunnel underneath the railroad tracks. That's in the town plan. So if the state ever wants to connect those two and give us the money to do it, 
we it's already in there. But if the state said, hey, here's the money, you can go do it. If it wasn't a town plan, we're not supposed to do it. Hmm. So that's where that is. Relative to BMW, we closed that application. We have not had any um, debates or any deliberations on it yet. The way the rule is from the day the applications closed, you have to act on the application within 65 days of the date of the closing of the hearing. So it's like a month and a half. Um, if you don't act on it, the application's auto automatically approved. So that's why we have to do these things. It's automatically approved. I think so. Wow. Yeah. So if you never, if you if you forgot, or you didn't pass the resolution because you missed the date, it's by de facto it gets approved. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So those are those two. Um, I'm trying to think. I don't know. Any surprises on any of the major developments? Everything is pretty much as you know on track, and there's been no major uh, timeline shifts or anything like that in federal or Palmer's or or uh, uh, I don't know if there is a timeline for Palmer's <laughs> I don't know I'm trying to find out myself yeah. um, you know they, it's that's that's a market financing thing if they can get you know construction financing you know I bet you they get back on track um, you know I'm rooting for them you know they, they don't reach out to me I don't think they really, maybe they reach out to Jeremy, but he usually tells me what's going on. And I haven't heard anything. Um, David Jeffries, his, he was supposed to have a topping off party or a topping off event for um, East Lane, which is his six, um, two, is it two? I think it's two buildings with six units each, which is 12 of his 14 affordables um, a couple of weeks ago. And I got invited, in, but he canceled it because of COVID. So, you know, I get my second shot on, I'm 55, so I get my second shot on, what's it, um, April 22nd. So he wants to do something, you know, and I think it'd be really cool to do something, but, you know, he's pretty smart where he does it. So he's to, he's got to do that first. That, to me, is an easy project. I, I'm 90% sure that all the... Um, the, the the ducks are in the row and the, the financing is taken care of for the gas station, the Tibbetts building mm -hmm. and the Taekwondo building. Those are the first three to be scraped. The the, the river got rerouted. That's all done. Um, he's probably going to pull the trigger on 34 Old Kings Highway soon. Um, so I think those four buildings, which is the gas station, Tibbetts and the Taekwondo guy and his and the 34, I think those were all going to pop at the same exact time. Okay. Um, you know, 34 All King's Side was actually kind of small for him, and I think that's stick built. Um, but <coughs> kind of scale, and then everybody moves over in terms yep. of penance, and then you go the other way. So, it's on the other side. Okay. Yeah. Um, you're going to see that the um, but the other thing that's really kind of cool is um, we approved basically every single restaurant and person that had outdoor use last summer, we approved them again for this summer. And and the thing that's also kind of cool is um, Bodega is doing some really cool thing that's like quasi-permanent. Um, 1020 is doing something that's very permanent. You know, they're spending thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars to put in um, to put in pergolas and tents and, and umbrellas. Um, both of those two guys are, I think Giovanni's is doing something again. You know, all the restaurants that came in last year, they all came back and we approved them. The governor's order, I think, is going to end all that stuff. Um, and it's, I don't, th it, the word <laughs> is not right. They would have died at the governor's desk, but we can make them further because they're still temporary. So even though some other towns might lose them, like New Canaan could lose them and, and Greenwich might lose them, we'll still have them because we already approved them. But next year, but next year could be an issue where there would have to be some kind of a financial relation uh, arrangement. <laughs> if the coal is over and, because the town owns those parking spaces. The, the only one where that's really an issue, the town owns it, is Bodega, the Goose, <laughs> and um, Upper Crust. But like, 
1020, that's privately owned. Um, Nino's Pizza is privately owned. Um, you know, Giovanni's <laughs> privately owned. Like the DCA, we said the DCA can put their thing in their backyard. Um, you're going to say what I call the, the Joyride Tina's Tent back on Corbin Drive. She's going to be inside again, pedaling her bicycle, bicycles. Um, so all that stuff is going to be back. And, and, you know, it's all temporary, but their temporary window goes from, I think it's May 1st to October 1st. I think those are the dates we gave them, um, which was the same as last year because they would all they would have all expired. And it's, I, mean, I think everybody's on the same page. We got to root for those people and have get as much you know patrons visiting them as they possibly can because i don't know anybody that really wants to ride a bicycle inside and sweat their tail off inside some rooms you know i'd rather do it outside so that's okay. that's the other thing that we did which is kind of cool um any any other questions guys you know, is, is, is i'll do it two more things is is Again, if you want to be on the planning zoning commission, talk to um, you know. Actually, if you're if you're unaffiliated, I think you talk to the first elections office. If you're either a Democrat or a Republican or another official party, you talk to your RTC, DCT, whatever whatever it is. Um, you know, because we have a couple seats that are up for re-election this year. There's three seats up for re-election this year. Um, I know one of the what somebody there's other boards like the ZBA um, they're going to have seats open too, um, so I encourage you to do that. I also encourage anybody that wants to send a letter into your. I mean, I call it the congressman, but send a letter into one of the four reps or all three of the four, all four of the four reps or whoever's in your district um, on whatever thoughts you have relative to any bills you want, and if you need help you know, with any statistics or stuff like that. You know, I know I know a lot of it. I know enough to be dangerous is what I was told my dad. Um, but th there was a guy that came to our board that talked talking about water. And I was like, wow. Mm -hmm. some, some people really research this stuff. And I was like, I never thought of that. You know, and they're, people just dig it in and dive it in. And I'm like, wow. You know, mm -hmm. like it's, I look at simple stuff like, units per acre like yeah. units per acre. i mean i think the proposal is 15 units per acre i mean has anyone been to avalon looks pretty dense and tight you know that's six units an acre you know, 15 is three times as dense as avalon and then the uh, the heights that is the new one the old town hall homes i mean the old um the old alan o'neill that's nine units per acre Imagine what 15 units per acre would look like. That's a lot to fill. You know, that's the way I look at stuff. I, I didn't understand all the stuff about the, in theory, the way a bill's written, we'd have to do 7,200 units, or there, there were just ridiculous numbers um, based on the way certain bills are written, and I didn't follow the math in that at all. And you don't have to go over it now. No, uh, but it's, it's it's bill 6611 it's 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 um nicknamed the fair share um but it, if you if you run the numbers you'd have to build another i think i think it's a thousand units or 1200 units to, to if, if that was enacted darian is required their fair share is 1200 units i've not run the numbers my only example is that in the 20 year period and that's the thing hanging on my wall, you know, of the 20 year period. Over 20 years, we built 866 multifamily units. If some mandate comes down because the fair share bill goes through and we're mandated to, to build 1,200 units, I don't have the foggiest idea where they go. I have no idea. I mean, you're, the one that's in Parklands, that one, that would be something like 59 or 60 units. It's, you know, it's a flip of the radar screen. Avalon is 189. You know, you'd have to do 10 Avalons. It's it's, it's not possible. You mentioned, you mentioned about the, the, the occupancy at three parklands. What, what is the occupancy of the office buildings in the 
COVID era you know, of the office buildings that are around Darien. I, I, I just did another, um, another assignment in Westport, Connecticut, um, and also did one in Darien. The occupancy of good office buildings in Darien that are close to the train station or close to the main drag is like less than 10%. Hmm. The guys that did, um, the guys that did two, 320 and 330 post road that it used to be called the green, now it's called the crossing. It's actually next to Duchess. They leased up their whole building. Um, in Westport, um, there was a vacant building called 55 Post Road West. Um, it is 30,000 feet. They leased, it actually, is, I mean, I don't mean to, to boast, but CBRE was the broker. They leased the entire building except for 2,000 square feet in COVID. The vacancy rate in Westport is like, you know, 8% for office. But if you're not on, if you're not on the main drag, and you're Parklands or, I mean, no offense to to Jerry Nielsen, his Thorndale Circle, um, I think his occupancy is lower than the stuff that's, you know, in the downtown core. Um, you know, if you see vacancy rates go less than 10%, you'll see new office buildings built. David Genovese's office building is one of Proposed, I think he's 80,000 feet or 75,000 feet. I think he's one of two that's proposed in all of Fairfield County. And the other mm -hmm. one, charter building that's in, in phase two. Stanford. The other, so low. The, other, the other thing that in terms of office occupancy, the thing that blows my mind is um, that rework shared office space is coming back to life because, you know, I can't, I mean, I can't work at home. I don't have a home office, you know, so I have to come into the office. In my office here, there's four of us. But those places that are the shared offices where you have the door, you close it, you know, in the one at Westport, there's, I think, 90 offices in there. They're all full. And I'm like, wow. Because it's also you can come out and there's someone sitting at the coffee room that's next to you. The compass has got an office at, at 320, 320 Post Road, you know, with a whole bunch of other people. So you can see downtown Stanford's getting crushed. Norwalk is getting crushed. So Stanford's vacancy is 30%. Norwalk's is 27%. You know, niche markets like Darien and Westport, Greenwich is, I think Greenwich is 6%. Now I just did a building in Greenwich. There's two, there's, there's two buildings in Greenwich that have space left. That's it. They're rent for $100 a foot though. You know, dairy ants are 40. The big difference. So, but the, the report that I gave to the RTM at the state of the town address, it's 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 gotten better since then. Real the residential real estate's gone up, you know, commercial real estate in our peer group has gone up. Um, the retail Darien, the one vacant space in Darien retail, which was Next to it was, um, what was that? What was it was called Tina Dragon. That was supposed to be a real estate office. They put an application in. It was probably going to be denied because it's only didn't allow for it. I'm told that space has already been rented to somebody else. David Genovese's project is all, I think it's 95% pre leased, and he hasn't put a shop on the ground. You know, the only biggest store I know in town is, is um, Brooks Brothers, and there's action on that thing still. So Darian's doing great. Right? <laughs> I don't want to knock it off the tracks. I'm going to keep it, keep it right down the middle of the road and keep it going. We're not doing anything wrong. Okay. All right, guys. Any other uh, questions? All right. Thanks for the opportunity, Amy. It's always good to talk Thank, to you. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, thanks very You're much, welcome. everybody. Thank you. Thank you very I'll much, Steve. Back, I'll go back uh, to work. Bye, everybody. Bye. bye. Um, can I have um, any other issues for the committee? No? Okay. Uh, meeting, uh, can I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. All right, Mike, and seconded. Second. Arlene, and all in favor? All right, guys. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks. Bye, guys. Thanks, Mike, for hosting. <laughs>